I want to be very clear. We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. That is the judgment of our Nuclear Regulatory Commission and many other experts. Furthermore, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and public health experts do not recommend that people in the United States take precautionary measures beyond staying informed. And going forward, we will continue to keep the American people fully updated, because I believe that you must know what I know as president. Right, okay, let's start from the beginning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the broadcast. This is your host, Hattrick Penry, and the name of the broadcast is Hattrick Penry Unbound because there is nothing, no subject that is too taboo or too difficult to address. Now, for those of you that are new to Plumegate, I'm going to try to remind myself that many people are joining my broadcast daily who may not be at the level of knowledge some of us are, so I need to hit you with a layman's terms and, and remind myself that some people don't know what a shill or a troll or have never heard about plume gate and don't know about a lot of these things. So let's let's do this right from the beginning with plume gate. And again, plume gate, this all began on March 11 of 2011. There was a uh, meltdown, a series of meltdowns in Fukushima, Japan. And plume gate is the evidence we have uncovered in the NRC Freedom of Information documents, which are free and available to the public online. Inside those documents, many of us researchers, well, I should say a handful of researchers, have gone in to discover that there was indeed a massive concerted effort to cover up and conceal the effects of the radioactive plume and fallout from Japan. In the documents, it's clearly indicated that they know all about Three Mile Island, they know all about Chernobyl, yet when Fukushima went down, we were not even given the common courtesy of rainwater warnings that other countries were. Okay, other countries were given rainwater warnings. France is a great example. And they were also told not to eat leafy green vegetables. So while we were in the direct path of the plume in the Pacific jet stream, and we were to suffer the uh, brunt of the uh, radioactive cloud and plume, we were not given any kind of a warning. Uh, we were not given proper precautions. In fact, the exact opposite, as you have just heard, President Obama told us everything is fine. And at the end of that week, by the 18th, I believe they had... Him and his family had taken a trip to South America, which was not a planned trip, is my understanding. Although if you look it up in the online now, they say it was pre-planned. But again, I tell you, we are in the 1984 George Orwellian era. And as if you clearly, if you've read my blog, if you've followed my videos, you know they can tamper with information. They can go on your computer. I was hacked this morning. I had to shut down and reboot everything. I had a major problem simply because I am... Uh, trying to expose an individual who is being less than forthright with the American public. So please keep that in mind. Now, as I've said, Plumegate is a massive multi-agency conspiracy, FEMA, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, NRC, USAID, White House. Uh, others were involved, clearly. And this, again, is, is clearly indicated in the FOIA documents. You can read all the uh, little bits and pieces that put together this massive orchestrated effort to hide this. Now, what has been the effect of the radioactive plume and clouds, you may ask? Well, there's several studies been done. The initial study was done by a, the sherman Mangano pair, Jeanette Sherman, and uh, Mangano can't think of his name off, first name offhand. And this was an excellent um, mortality index study this showed us, indeed, the 14 weeks prior to the meltdown, the death rate was at one particular level. 14 weeks after, the measured 14 weeks after the plume and radioactive fallout hit, the mortality rate rose significantly, especially in uh, infants because their cells are dividing at a higher rate. The initial study put the figures at 14 weeks after um, around 13,000. That was later updated with a more in-depth um, analysis, and they brought the numbers initial to 14 weeks after the radioactive plume hit uh, the North, North America. That number was bumped up to 20-something thousand, 22,000. I've also gone in and highlighted a number of um, things from Bobby One, who is an excellent researcher, who has also gone into the mortality index study and indicated long-term what we can expect from the fallout from Fukushima. And by that, I mean by the year 2030. And these, again, these are estimates, but we're going to look at oh, well over a million fatalities. Now, this again, I'm, as my understanding, this is just in North America. 
Now, we're not talking about the rest of the world. And when you go to Chernobyl, and if you look at the Sherman Mangano study, I believe there's a link on my broadcast if you want to look into that. And I strongly, strongly suggest that you read the Chernobyl costs and consequences of the catastrophe for people and environment. I'm paraphrasing there. It's a long title, but I've got the link in there. Very interesting read. And, and they knew everything from Chernobyl. And Chernobyl had a cover-up as well. It was neighboring states that indicated, hey, we're picking up radiation at our nuclear plants. Our sensors are going off. Russia, what can you tell us? It's coming from your direction. Talk to us. And they denied it as long as they could, but ultimately the truth leaks out. In the Chernobyl study, you can clearly see that, um, you know, 900,000, a million people over time will have perished from the, the uh impact of the radiation. And this doesn't have to be one particular illness. They could die from a thyroid problems or cancer or just any number of things. So sometimes it's difficult to point and say, hey, this person died from cancer related to Fukushima. Again, a classic disinformation tactic is to insist on 100% absolute proof. Well, we're pretty close to that with Fukushima and the meltdowns. I've provided the Chernobyl Fukushima bird study, which is an excellent scientific study that also matches the methodology and the results of the Sherman Mangano study. And again, this is the same thing that the um, Nestorinko and Nestorinko couple and the Yablokov, I believe, is the other scientist in the Chernobyl study. All of these studies are in agreement. They're congruent, the methodology is the same, and the results, the end analysis, appears to be the same. We also have the Fukushima fingerprint that even Arnie Gundershill will tell you on Fairwinds that they have matched the particular radiation that has hit the West Coast and indeed all of North America. Michigan is hard hit as well. Florida is hard hit as well. Uh, they've matched us to Fukushima, so we have a lock on this. Now, People will ask, well, if it, so many people died and if the cover was so huge, why is no one in jail? Why, is, why are there no subpoenas going out? Why is there no court case? Well, that's a very good question. And again, I would put to you that the level of information control in the United States and indeed in this global conspiracy, and I'm going to play you a clip from JFK later. I've gone in and clipped just a very relevant section as to what he talks about this conspiracy. Their, their best skill set is information suppression. And they're second to none when they do that. And I, I say that because if you go out amongst the mainstream media, have a nice long look at the so-called alternative media, and then take yourself a look at the independent media, which is now being very heavily infiltrated because it is the last area they can infiltrate, and you will see there is a complete lack of discussion about Plumegate. Not the radiation, not the radioactive kelp, not the strawberries that are becoming deformed, about the proof of the multi-agency cover-up contained within the Freedom of Information documents. And not just that, when you look at these docu documents, you really begin to understand just how corrupt and failed the nuclear power industry is. It's, it's, it's outdated, it's very dangerous, and it's this huge, giant conspiracy cover-up keeping the whole thing running, right? It's like an old, broke-down 1970 Cadillac, and these people keep throwing old parts on it, but you know the car's got to be parked and put off the side of the road sooner or later. Somebody's going to get hurt. So their information control is second to none. And the evidence of this, well, when this happened, this was Obama's run-up to the election, folks. And we can conclude one of three things with Obama. Because either he knew all about it and helped cover it up, or he's a total bungling idiot and had no clue, or he's just lied to everybody around him. But any, either of those possibilities is horrible. And the guy still got elected because alternative media, by and large, remained very quiet on the subject. Arnie Gunderson doesn't talk about the FOIA documents. If he does, it's only in passing. He'll even tell you he knows what's in them. But he won't talk. He won't elaborate on it. He won't make a, a, a highlight it. He won't showcase it. He will not go in depth. Why? Because it is extremely damning of the federal government, all these agencies tasked with keeping Americans safe? Well, obviously not. If they would conceal and hide the radioactive plume, I put it to you, they would destroy the two buildings. They would blow up the federal building. They would engage in illegal activities abroad and at home. You have only to study and put your own time into this to discover for yourself. Don't take it from me. I'm going to tell you just like Bill Cooper. Don't trust me. I'm telling you right now, don't trust me. And I'm telling you right now, check everything I say and double check it. I insist upon it. Plus, I want to get you involved. I want to get people involved in exposing the corruption that resulted in so many American deaths of innocent lives and innocent children. Now, today I want to go ahead and dig right into the screen captures that we have because I've promised 
each show from here on out, I'm not going to be distracted. We're going to talk 30 minutes, maybe more, but at least 30 minutes about Plumegate until something happens in this country and I see people going to jail. And I should see mass arrests on an unprecedented scale. And until Patrick Penry sees that, they have control. And they are clearly in control. And we are along for the ride. And it's not a pleasant ride. This is not a circus ride. Okay, we're not at Disney World anymore. This is very serious. People are dying over this. Okay, I'm going to read to you. I'm going to preface all these discussions of Plumegate with the reason why we are saddled with this outdated, archaic power system, which is just a monopoly that you or I cannot recreate in our backyard. It's simply thus. Let me read to you from David Wilcox's book, The Source Field Investigations. Please put your opinions of David Wilcox to the side. I know he's very controversial, but this information is garnered from the Institute for New Energy and also from the Federation of American Scientists. Quote, According to the Institute for New Energy, as of 1997, quote, the U.S. Patent Office has classified over 3,000 patent devices or applications under the secrecy order. Title 35, U.S. Code 1952, Sections 181 through 188, end quote. The Federation of American Scientists revealed that by the end of fiscal year 2010, this number had ballooned to 5,135 inventions and included, quote, review and possible restriction, end quote, on any solar cell with greater than 20% efficiency or any power system that is more than 70 to 80% efficient at converting energy. Now, this is all documented here, and you can read where he gets the sources from. According to Dr. O'Leary, some researchers are bought off and their discoveries put on a shelf. Others are threatened into submission, while others die under strange circumstances. You may be familiar with Stan Meyer's water car. I wrote about this early on with my gig with the Intel Hub before I quit the Intel Hub. And I, I like to tell that story because it's an amazing invention. Uh, basically, Stan Meyer's, what he did, I believe it's called electrolysis. You separate the oxygen from the hydrogen. You have two units of hydrogen, one unit of oxygen. If you apply enough electricity, it, apparently it separates this, and you can have your hydrogen, and you can have your oxygen. It's very flammable, very combustible, much more efficient than gasoline. What is the byproduct? There is no byproduct. That's what I'm told. So his water car that literally split water into a flammable gas ran it right into the pistons on a regular uh, engine, just like in your fossil fuel uh, vehicle you have outside, and he was able to drive down the highway. There's an old ABC a news video from back in the day, way back in the day, that shows Stan Myers driving down the highway on his dune buggy running on water. Now, the Pentagon naturally was very interested. The story ends up at a Cracker Barrel restaurant where Stan Myers, meeting with the Pentagon, runs into the parking lot yelling, they poisoned me, and he dies in the parking lot. You can't make this stuff up. I implore you to research and look into this yourself. This is exactly how it happens. Now, those are the ones that they have to deal with harshly. In my own personal experience, my father, who is a retired nuclear physicist that taught at the University of Florida, Ori originally did uh, thin film detectors and then went on to mass spectrometry and has a number of patents, improvements on the ma mass spectrometer. He's got what I call a super battery. It's just a very efficient design, a new a design on a battery, highly efficient. Well, he, he had a number of proposals that the Bush administration and Obama administration called my dad in, called a number of scientists in. He wasn't the only one. And they had a press conference to say, hey, we're looking into alternative energy. We're such awesome, nice guys. We want to get off the oil and get off this other stuff. And they talked about my dad's invention, and they never called him back. They never had anything to do with him ever again. And, but they used it as a press uh, coverage potential to make it appear as if they were concerned, and they appear as if they were interested in alternative energies. Meanwhile, my dad, who writes out these proposals, which are extremely detailed and lengthy and time-consuming to come up with, they're all denied. Everyone is denied. See, they don't have to seize upon his, upon his patent because they just won't finance him. They just won't help him to bring his product to market. This is also very similar with a guy in Australia who has a self-contained Tesla device, whatever you want to call it, that generates thousands of watts of electricity. But he said when he goes to the bank to ask for funding to go to production, he is denied every time. Why? It threatens the power monopoly. The current power monopoly, what is that? Nuclear power. Is it safe? No. We are going to find out all nuclear plants have effluence. Okay, that's a nice word the NRC came up with, or somebody did, to say radioactive discharge, and they all do it. Google Tooth Fairy Project and look into that, and you'll see the closer to a nuclear power plant you go, when they test the children's teeth, the baby teeth of the children, they find higher levels of strontium-90. It can only be from the power plant. It's not Cold War era bomb testing. That's what the shills and nuclear apologists want you to believe. 
They have all the money in the world to convince you that up is down, that hot is cold, that nuclear power is safe. Okay, we're looking at a screen capture from the FOIA documents. I've been very clear. These are free and available to the public. I implore you to please have a look for yourself, talk about it, write about it, blog about it. These are kind of talking points, if you will. They want to control the question. They want to control the answer. Question number three, I've kind of selected through. This was uh, by request from Miss Milky the Clown. Thank you very much for all your hard work, Miss Milky the Clown. And this is a, from a document. I've given you the link if you want to examine the actual document. And I've picked from this series of questions some of the ones that really kind of show the public answer they're willing to tell us and the additional technical non-public information that we don't ever get to hear. Okay. Unless you dig in and find out for yourself. I mean, really, it's there. But you have to have the desire to know. Question number three. What should people in Alaska, Hawaii, and the West Coast do to protect themselves from fallout? Public answer. The available evidence shows the United States can be expected to avoid any impacts from radioactive material, so no public action is necessary. We believe there is very low risk to the U.S. considering the long distance from the U.S. and the type of event. The NRC continues to analyze the available information, and existing monitoring equipment can detect any materials before they could present a hazard. Additional technical non-public information. NRC is working with DHS, EPA, and other federal partners to ensure monitoring equipment is properly positioned based on meteorological and other relevant information. Not too terribly damning, but to be sure, you know, they're, they're, they're claiming they're going to position their monitoring equipment. And let's have a look at the, the next screen. And keep in mind, the, the first answer is very, uh, what's, it's very soft and very easy, okay? It doesn't hurt you at all. When if you really wanted to be honest, you would say, you know, after Three Mile in Chernobyl, we know for a fact a plume is always released and it's carried all throughout the northern hemisphere on low levels. And we now know that they've been lying to us. Low levels of radiation are very dangerous. In fact, I've read they can be more dangerous than the higher levels because by the time you've been subjected to that high level, you're pretty much screwed. At the lower levels, your body's perfect. Any change in that body is a damn serious change, folks, especially with the children whose cells are dividing at a higher rate congruent with the bird study where the guy looked at the birds, the birds eat the worms, the worms eat the leaves, the leaves were laden with cesium, and they had a die-off of the baby birds. This is just we've had a die-off of the baby humans, right? Next screen capture is from Alexander Higgins' blog. I hope I don't go too fast for you, but we have a lot of material to cover, and this is very crucial and important that I'm able to cover as much as possible in the time I have allotted. Okay, again, this is from Alexander Higgins' blog. Confirmed, EPA rigged RADNET, Japan Nuclear Radiation Monitoring Equipment, to report lower levels of Fukushima fallout. Let me put it in layman's terms. Prior to the meltdowns on March of 2011, the EPA monitors had a particular baseline background level it would read out across the board. Say this is the standard radiation that's all over the place all the time. Okay. After the incident, they had to go in and change that to, quote, unquote, recalibrate it. Well, when they did, the baseline, in other words, the background radiation, dropped even lower than before. So it kind of busted there that prior to the incident, it was one level background. After they fooled and tampered with it and rigged it, it drops even below. And we all know that is impossible. In the FOIA documents, they clearly admit they know all about Three Mile. They know all about Chernobyl. In Three Mile Island, the DOE said nothing happened. Everything's safe. Everything's fine. But, but they paid out a $1.3 million settlement to a family with a Down syndrome child. That is an admission of guilt as far as I'm concerned, and that just proves the deception these people are willing to go to to protect this most dangerous industry. If you have kids, folks, you ought to really be concerned. You need to get active and you need to get involved. It's just a handful of people working on this. We're looking for some assistance. Next question, number eight, what happens when, if a plant melts down? Public answer, in short, nuclear power plants in the United States are designed to be safe. To prevent the release of radioactive material, there are multiple barriers between the radioactive material and the environment, including the fuel cladding, the heavy steel reactor vessel itself, and the containment building, usually a heavily reinforced structure of concrete and steel several feet thick. Additional technical, non-public information. The melted core may melt through the bottom of the vessel and flow onto the concrete containment floor. The core may melt through the containment liner and release radioactive material into the environment. This is a perfect example. 
They don't want to scare the first herd of sheep into thinking when one of these things melts down. Let me tell you something. When you have an all-out meltdown, it's released every time. It, I have never heard of an incident where there's a meltdown and nothing ever got out. That's just patently absurd and insane to even think that. Now, we've got tons of these reactors over here, and many of them are the same Mark I or Mark II design. So we are sitting ducks, folks. Question number nine, should people in Japan take Ki, potassium iodine, potassium iodine, fools if you take it it fills your system and it fools your system into thinking it's already got enough so when you're subjected to the radioactive iodine it is excreted through your waist and your urine and your fecal matter and is ejected from the body so it's very important that if you're next to a power plant it melts down cesium iodine two of the most common ones released you want to take it as prescribed by officials because you want to make sure you're not taking it when you don't need it but but it is effective it is effective Additional technical non-public information. There are a range of protective measures that we use. The most effective is evacuation. Government officials are responsible for determining the best means to protect their public. KI, potassium iodine, is another means for protection, but evacuation and sheltering are the primary means that is used. Well, they're not being very honest here, because when you look into the emergency plans for the Comanche nuclear power plant, you clearly see that the you know, you may be told to evacuate when a sheriff makes his way out to your house, right? When the local sheriff makes out to your house, because there's no guarantees. Your phone ain't going to ring. Your cell phone might not give you notice. They are ill-prepared to inform people that there has been an incident. As I say, clearly in that document, it may come to the point a sheriff has to go out and start knocking door to door. Now, I tell you, meltdown doesn't wait for a sheriff to make it to your house. I hope you understand that. And by the way, I've had a folder that I was putting together on potassium iodine because early on, our Surgeon General came out on the mainstream media and said it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to stock up on some KI, potassium iodine. Well, folks, within an hour, she came back out on mainstream media to retract that statement and say you didn't need it. Interestingly enough, before anyone was sent to Fukushima in the NRC or from our alphabet agencies, they were supplied with potassium iodine. Not only that, we were shipping it over to Japan so they could have plenty because they didn't have enough. At the same time, they like to tell us over here it's not that big a deal. Not that big a deal. Well, I liken it to this. If you throw me into a pit with five poisonous snakes, I would rather you throw me the antidote for one of those snakes. At least that way I only have to worry about four more. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's just the way I see it. Question number 10, moving right along. Was there any damage to U.S. reactors from either the earthquake or the resulting tsunami? Public answer, no. Additional technical non-public information. Diablo Canyon Units 1 and 2 declared an unusual event based on tsunami warning following the Japanese earthquake. They have since exited the unusual event declaration based on a downgrade to a tsunami advisory. Also, they don't tell you about the, I can't think of the name of the plant offhand, Anna, I think, Anna Power Plant. They had an earthquake there, and there was major damage to the building. Hey, it's still up and running is what I'm told, and you can see the cracks in the concrete structure and the rebar sticking out. I'm like thinking to myself, these guys are insane because they're only concerned about profit. They want to keep them. I'm sure the owners of these plants, they don't live anywhere nearby. They probably don't live in this country. I would suspect they're probably down in South America somewhere where if something goes wrong, they're as far away from a meltdown as possible because they know. Believe me, they know everything I know and a heck of a lot more because they've been doing this for years and years and years. Okay, next screen capture. It's titled, Compiled Seismic Questions for Response to the March 11. Well, that'd be 2011. See in here, they've got some mistakes. This is 2001, we know that. March 11, 2011, Japanese earthquake and tsunami. There may be some typographical errors. The below list of questions and answers has been compiled from multiple sources, including questions forwarded from NRC staff, GI-199 Communications Plan, Diablo Canyon Communications Plan, the NEI website. NEI, very unreliable. They, they still to this day insist that nuclear power is clean and emission-free. When we all know we've got leftover radioactive waste and all nuclear plants have radioactive discharge. They call it an effluent. That's a nice name. Sounds nice. But it is a radioactive discharge. Believe me, if pressure gets too much, they are going to vent before the meltdown. It's the lesser of two evils, folks. Okay, it says, currently it is in rough draft shape and should not be distributed beyond those who need it in the short term. You know, in these documents, they're very clear uh, that some information is for us, you know, the, the, the very nice, kind uh, information, and then the hard, brutal information they get to know all about, we don't get to know. 
Has this changed our perception of earthquake risk? Public answer. This does not change the NRC's perception of earthquake hazard at U.S. plants. As is prudent, the NRC will be looking closely at this incident and the effects on the Japanese nuclear power plant in the future to see if any changes are necessary to NRC regulations. I ought to cut in here and say there was a team, that the protective measures team, when they made a lot of suggestions, but the ones, and my mom and I looked at it and both said, hey, these, these guys called some good shots here. They made some great recommendations, but you can clearly see the ones that are expensive or the ones that reveal just how dangerous it is, they have no intention of making any quick move in that direction. If it's easy and they can just write up a new procedure, that's what they do. That's what they do. Okay, back to the public answer. It is too early to tell what the lessons from this earthquake are from an engineering perspective, which is absolutely insane because the protective measures team is there and giving them good information right off the bat. The NRC will look closely at all aspects of response of the plants to the earthquake to determine if any actions need to be taken in U.S. plants. Additional technical, non-public information. We expect that there would be lessons learned, and we may need to seriously relook at common cause failures, including dam failure and tsunami. And dam failure, if you're not familiar with what that is, let's look at Fort Calhoun and Fort Cooper. And I'm, off the top of my head, can't think of the river that runs by there, but it runs north to south. And back in 2011, there was a major engineered storm system using the chemtrails and electromagnetic engineering, and they dumped water above Fort Calhoun and Cooper for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you remember the Corps of Engineers was up there building uh, dams and doing what they could. But in the end, uh, Fort Calhoun, if you look at it, it was flooded, and water came up right around the building. Someone even punctured a hole in the, um, what do you call it? It's like a dam they build up there. Someone punctured a hole in the rubber covering, and it leaked in, and, and things got really bad there. Things got real. That's the truth of it all, folks is that it only takes one dam to break. It only takes one major flood and the things to leak past the system and flood electronics. And as we well know in Fukushima, the electronics were destroyed, even to the point that they were grabbing batteries out of cars, trying to link them in series to try to get juice to activate some of the components they needed to offset a criticality, and it did not work. And if you look in the documents, clearly they talk about the fact that when these things are flooded, the salt water, you have to not, you can't just, turn a generator on, you have to build the circuit boxes back up again. You have to put the buses back in, all the electrical components that were damaged by salt water. Folks, this is insane. Again, I read to you the suppressed technology. Keep in mind, we are forced to use this dangerous technology. Why? Because it is a monopoly they can control. That's why they don't want solar cells and solar panels to become 80% efficient, for you and I can put them and maybe build them ourselves, maybe even build them ourselves. Are U.S. plants susceptible to the same kind of loss of power as happened in Japan? Public response. Yes, in the sense that sites can lose off-site power. Also, hurricane or tornado-related high winds may potentially damage the transmission network in the vicinity of a nuclear plant. Floodwaters can also affect transformers used to power station auxiliary system. These types of weather-related events have the potential to degrade the off-site power source to a plant. The on-site emergency diesel generators need fuel oil stored in tanks that are normally buried underground. These tanks and associated pumps slash piping require protection from the elements. Above-ground tanks have tornado slash missile protection. In case both off-site and on-site power supplies fail, NRC has required all licensee to evaluate for a loss of all AC power station blackout scenario, and implement coping measures to safely shut down the plant. Again, they're requiring them to evaluate. I'm not worried about evaluating or writing up procedures. I'm worried about actually having a system that in the event there's off-site power failure and you have no juice, how are you going to maintain the pumps? That's what I want to know. For long term, for long term, what if a Carrington event happened and we lost a major grid system, and they only have diesel generators. And if you look at what it would take to keep a plant going just on the backup stuff, it's, it's, it's almost impossible, folks. It's not going to happen. What if 10 plants went down at the same time? This is a national security uh, urgency of the highest degree, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that we are not at this very moment systematically decommissioning and shutting down these nuclear power plants is in of itself a national security emergency absolute national security emergency for what happened in Fukushima, not can, it will. It is a matter of time. You throw in this rogue element that's using weaponized weather, and we've witnessed the superstorm Sandy be 
intensified and directed. And as I've said, I have plenty of videos on YouTube if you want to watch. You can see where I've documented the intensification of storm systems around Fort Cooper in an attempt to flood. Remember, Obama had a blackout on Fort Cooper. Many of you may never have even heard about it. But there's some stunning photographs you can look at where the water comes right up to the building, and boy, we has a close call there, folks. Even Gunder Schill right now is saying today, I just read something, that we should shut down Fort Calhoun. Even Gunder Schill says that, right? The guy that won't talk about the FOIA documents. Folks, we're in a bad way. Additional technical non-public information. Some plants have safeguards equipment below sea level and rely on watertight doors or bilge pumps to remove water from equipment required to support safe shutdown. Overflowing rivers can result in insurmountable volume of water flooding the vulnerable areas. Folks, that, you know, that's what they don't want you to know. That's why that's additional technical non-public information. You are on a need to know. You do not need to know the facts. You do not need to know reality. You do not need to know how dangerous and it failed of a system nuclear power is. Sure, it makes great weapons. You can blow a lot of people up. But, folks, if one child dies from radiation, I'm over it. I'm over it. I don't want it anymore. I want solar power, the sun. The sun is – have you ever seen a picture of how big the sun is compared to Earth? A size top comparison? Wow. Wow. And we're not allowed to tap into an 80% efficient solar panel because they restrict it. Folks, that is a crime against humanity. I firmly believe this is treasonous and a hanging offense. Just like in the Nuremberg trials, one day it is my firm prayer, my firm belief, and my hope – that these people are held accountable. There will be mass arrest. You will be charged with crimes against humanity and treason against the United States of America and the American public. And the penalty for that, my understanding, is hanging until dead. Okay? I'm very clear about that. These people have the opportunity now to join our side and do the right thing. We, even to some extent, may forgive and forget if we can just correct these problems we have. But if you continue to, uh, to hamper our effort to awake the American public, if we ever do awake them and get control, make no mistake, justice will be served. How high were the tsunami at the plants? Public response. The actual tsunami height at the plants is not known. Again, there's some topographical errors. It says now no, but obviously this thing is not known. However, NOAA has information on the recordings at sea for many areas, but they don't tell you that. Additional technical non-public information, and we'll look at the next screen capture, and you'll see they have buoys out there. The military is able to precisely know everything. In fact, I tell you that since the Indonesian tsunami, when we had just launched two satellites that were able in 2004, for the first time ever, to record the whole 2004 tsunami, Indonesian tsunami event. Now, if you've looked into this, and right now in the alternative media, it's hitting pretty hard. The Project SEAL from the 1950s from New Zealand, a joint United Kingdom, joint U.S., joint New Zealand effort to perfect a tsunami bomb. Now, the tsunami bombs originally were uh, made of TNT and that kind of explosive. It was not a nuclear bomb. But you can clearly see in the lagoon this series of pictures where they are experimenting with the size of the explosive, the amount of the explosive, and the depth at which they plant this bomb. And you can see in the uh, a series of pictures that it's very effective at creating this huge wave that swamps the whole lagoon. By the time they perfect it, know the right depth and the right charge to get the maximum effect. Be, be clear and make no mistake, Russia's working on this weapon at the same time. And if you dig around and look, you will see that each side back in the day was wanting to have this as a potential a weapon of war. If you think of Russia doing something like this off the eastern seaboard, we're in deep trouble. We're in deep trouble if a 30-foot wave sweeps over. Sandy was bad enough, but imagine a giant 30-foot, 50-foot, 60-foot. What, 100-foot? What are they going to do about a 100-foot tsunami? It is theoretically possible and has happened in the past. Okay, additional technical non-public information. This is for the question, how high were the tsunamis at the plants? A preliminary rough estimate of tsunami height at the plant locations was provided to NRC by NOAA shortly after the earthquake. This is shown in the additional information section. Most notably, there was a six-meter wave at Fukushima, and the wave at Onagawa may have been between 18 and 23 meters. And the next screen capture is taken directly from the Freedom of Information for you documents pertaining to the cover-up of the radioactive plume and cloud that's caused over 50,000 deaths so far. It's more than that. I'm being conservative. And this is the tsunami wave heights from the NOAA. And here's what they know. Here's what they know. And just go down and look and see 24.8 or 0.3 meters, 6.1, 5.5, 2.2. Uh, you can see that the waves were uh, very large. 
I'll just put that very large and very threatening. And what do we have for protection here? We have a warning system. That's what they were able to do, issue an unusual event at uh, the Senate Ofri, and that's all they could do, and just hope for the best, and hope it's not a 30-meter wave. Okay, now we're looking at a screen capture of an email from Savinki Christine to Austin Dorf William, and this says, it's subject, briefing on NRC response to recent nuclear events in Japan, followed by agenda planning. She says, Bill, I know you've already approved this, but I thought you wanted to engage in preliminary discussions of the agency's approach to a lessons learned review. A non-Sunshine Act agenda planning session will not allow us to discuss that topic. We would need to have a closed meeting under Exemption 9, which I thought was what we had discussed on Tuesday. Did you change your view on this? You know, this is important here because it shows that in some sessions they'll talk about anything, and in other sessions they can't talk about everything. There is a um, email, series of email, it's not in this session here, but I've gone over this in a previous broadcast, where someone is complaining, nay, they're bitching about the fact that the guy says, well, if, if all my email is going to be uh, Freedom of Information Act, I cannot do my job, he says. Well, what does that tell you? That tell you his job is deception-based, because he can't out in the open, in the sunshine, in an act of righteousness, do perform his acts of righteousness, for they are not righteous, ladies and gentlemen. They are acts of deception and wickedness. I put it to you, and the fact that this industry is unable to be forthright and honest with the American public in and of itself is so incredibly damning to me that I have to ask myself, why is the American public not in an outrage and out on the streets right now over this question? Well, folks, it's called information control. Let me answer that's a trick question. Information control. And we'll talk about the four herds today, too. We're going to cover all of this. I want you to know how they manage to manipulate all these different groups of people because they have to be treated differently uh, as they're in different stages of awakening. And we'll cover this. I want you to understand how they are treating us and how they are responding to us. They have a plan and they have a method by which they're going to fool us and deceive us. And it's been very effective. Okay, the next screen capture is the end of a letter. I just wanted to show you that Edward J. Markey and Lois Capps, I believe these are House of Representatives. You know, if you look at the House of Reps, some of those people ask good questions. Even Barbara Boxer sent letters asking questions. Uh, Congressman Blumenauer uh, asked Jaxco questions. Some of them even said, Jaxco, you may have bro broken the law. You did this, this, and this. You're not supposed to do that. You kind of hampered the investigation. There's a lot of stuff going on. But make no mistake, some of our representatives, not many, not the smallest percentage were concerned and, and wrote letters and asked hard questions. By and large, the majority of them are either ignorant or know darn well and are bought and paid off for. There was a, a joke I read on Facebook earlier that said the announcement, a news alert, the Koch brothers had stated that if Obama, if they tax the rich anymore, they're going to have to lay off several congressmen, right? And that's that kind of funny, but unfortunately very true. Someone has bought these people, and they're bought and paid for. The system's broken. Don't think you're going to vote and elect some. I'm not voting anymore. I am never going to vote again. I can tell you that now. Fact. I'll never vote. Well, again, I'd have to see legitimate system. No debold voting machines. No foreign countries counting the votes. It would have to be a legitimate system. The people would have to be informed. The first herd, the masses of ignorant people would have to have enlightenment for them to make an informed decision, right? And that would be voting, would be an informed decision. And if they had enlightenment, they would know the system's rigged. They wouldn't vote. They would demand a new voting system. Okay, this letter was written to the Honorable Greg Jacksco, and I don't know how honorable he really is, but he was probably more honorable than a lot of the others that are still there. And Jacksco, to a limited extent, tried to do a couple things that maybe got him sent down the road. So don't think you're going to have a shining knight in armor come in there and stand up for what's right, because we all, I'll play a clip from JFK, guess what they did to him. Okay, and this letter there, again, I could read through some of it I will read to you because it's important that they're pointing out some of the dangerous aspects of nuclear power. But there's a series of letters from three or four congressmen all about saying the same thing. They're saying, hey, if pollution from China makes it over here, you're telling us we don't have anything to worry about, a multiple meltdown? What about Chernobyl, did they say? So they ask hard questions. Not everyone is bought and paid for. And then here he says, the 9.0 magnitude earthquake caused a number of Japan's nuclear reactors to shut down automatically. However, a combination of tsunami-related damage and the long duration, again, I ought to cut in here and say, look, what if we have an earthquake and a blizzard at the same time? Okay, and a plant goes down and no one can get to it because of the blizzard, right? Think about this. We need a power production system that if everything goes awry, if everything goes to pot, we're safe. Like I say, a solar cell, it doesn't melt down. 
you know, you can even smash one in front of me if you want. You can smash a solar panel in front of me. I'll wear a protective thing because if the glass breaks, I don't want glass particles. But other than that, it's fairly innocuous if, if a tree falls on it. Nuclear power plant, you know, folks, we've gone through Three Mile. We went through Chernobyl. We're suffering from Fukushima. No one's doing anything about it. Wow, folks. Now write your congressman ten times. When he copy-pastes you, do a YouTube video that your congressman copy and paste you back the talking points response. Okay, the guy goes on to say, a combination of tsunami-related damage and the long duration of the external power outages have subsequently led some of these reactors, emergency diesel generators, and thus cooling systems to fail. To reduce rising pressure inside the Fukushima reactors, radioactive vapor is being vented, but three explosions have occurred at these pressure, as these pressures grew too high. It appears as though meltdowns are proceeding at these reactors. We now know they had three meltdowns right off the bat, and we, were with, we knew about it. We knew about it early on. Now life-threatening levels of radiation are being emitted. A 19-mile evacuation and no-fly zone has been established. A fire at a spent fuel pool at one of the units occurred, and 1,350 of the plant's 1,450, 1,450 workers have been evacuated. Radioactive materials such as cesium and iodine have been detected as much as 100 miles away from the reactors. This is preliminary information. This guy is working on a total lack of information, and this is the best he can come up with. We now know it was much worse than that. We now know that if you went outside the Chernobyl protection zone, if you took the Chernobyl protection zone and dropped it right over Fukushima and went to the edge of that line where Russia says, hey, you're safe to live here or as safe as you can be, they had independent scientists test there, not just for cesium and iodine. Again, clearly in the documents, they love to test for cesium and iodine. Why? A relatively short half-life, eight days if I'm not mistaken in the case of iodine. So they know if they test for these two substances that don't last that long, and if they wait, It'll, it'll test low, and it'll give you a false perception of what has really happened and a false perception of the real, the actual damages, the actual impact we suffered from this radioactive plume and cloud. And, in fact, this plume travels around the globe, I'm told, every 40 days. Scientists have said, look, the bulk of the plume is still flying around. You can test it's hotter than everything else. So on the other side of that Chernobyl zone, these independent scientists say, hey, we're not only testing for iodine and cesium, we're going to test for a, a a lot more stuff, multiple radioactive substances, and indeed what they found was startling. It was four times as much on the other side of that Chernobyl zone than it should have been. So clearly the protective zone is underestimated, and again, why is this? This is to protect nuclear power. They don't want you to know that if the Turkey Point uh, in South Florida melted down, they don't want you to know you'd have to evacuate all those you know, millions of people. Same with the, we got one up there near New York. They don't want you to know what would happen and what would take place in the event of a meltdown because it's so incredibly serious, and there's no easy way out. And Fukushima is still releasing radioactive particles as I speak, and there's been no real earnest move that I've seen like they did in, in Chernobyl to build a sarcophagi and entomb the damn thing. And again, if someone's going to go around and do a series of videos saying Fukushima was a depopulation event, I'm going to say, tell me more, tell me more. Because if it wasn't a depopulation event, why were we not given simple rainwater warnings? Why were we not told that maybe some of us might have to take potassium iodine? Why weren't we warned to stay off the green leafy vegetables? Why did Hillary Clinton come and say, Fukushima food's fine to eat. We're still eating sushi. Heck, we're eating stuff out of the Gulf of Mexico because Obama had a PR opportunity where he supposedly dined on a shrimp and, and seafood from the Gulf, but if you read into the article, someone had gone in and found out that that had been imported from somewhere else. That was a photo op to convince you Gulf seafood is still safe. Why would they do that if it's been contaminated with Corexit? Why would they tell you everything's fine from Fukushima if we're being hit, if we're being poisoned? Well, again, these people with the videos that Fukushima is a depopulation event, I say, tell me more. Tell me more, mate. I'd like to know more, right? Okay, next screen capture. According to analysis, this is, again, out of the letter. According to the analysis prepared by Representative Markey, there are eight nuclear reactors located on the seismically active west coast of the United States and 27 nuclear reactors located near the New Madrid fault line in the Midwest. There are additionally 31 nuclear reactors in the United States that are of the same Mark I or Mark II design as those currently imperiled in Japan, and 12 of these are located in seismically active zones. According to its website, the San Onofre Nuclear Power Plant, which is located 40 miles from Long Beach, California, is designed to withstand a 7.0 magnitude earthquake. An NRC staff memo indicates that the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant, which is located 12 miles from San Luis Obispo, California, 
is designed to withstand a 7.5 magnitude earthquake. But according to the Southern California Earthquake Center, there's an 82% probability of an earthquake of 7.0 magnitude occurring in the next 30 years and a 37% probability that an earthquake of 7.5 magnitude will occur. Again, it's not if, it's a matter of when. And, I, you know, if you've been paying attention to the geological uh, happenings on planet Earth in the last couple years, I suppose, the mass animal diet, the volcanoes, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the incredible weather systems. Again, a lot of this is engineered. A lot of this is electromagnetic. But I, my point being is that we are in a very dangerous time. Whether it's a rogue element using Tesla technology, again, in 1997, you have uh, um, uh, General Cohen speaking to the fact that the, even now there are eco-terrorists using electromagnetic weaponry to remotely set off volcanoes, to remotely set off earthquakes. Prior to the Haiti earthquake, okay, you guys remember the Haiti earthquake. You guys probably know that Monsanto tried to shove a whole bunch of their genetically modified seeds on them after that. A day before that earthquake, Southcom in, in South Florida does a hurricane drill for Haiti. Okay, now you may be familiar with this. In 9-11, there was a drill going on that day for plane hijackings. I'm told in Sandy Hook, there was a drill going on that day. I'm told in the federal building bombing or prior, the day prior or the, maybe that same day there was a drill going on. This seems to be a systematic pattern over time. I want nuclear shutdown shut down because it is a terrorist target, all right. It's a terrorist target of the New World Order, folks, of the Illuminati, plain and simple, and I'm not afraid to say it. Okay, i got a couple more screen captures on this, and, and, the, and he, he points out, you know, <laughs> just how vulnerable we are. Let me put it that way. He discusses the spent fuel pools as well. There's a Robert Alvarez study out you can look at. Also, and I should mention the NRC FOIA documents, the White House requests a spent fuel pool assessment. And they don't ever do anything about it because when you get that assessment, you look and say, holy crap, you have any idea how much spent fuel is backlogging up in this country? There's no place to put it, no place to put it. They don't want to talk. They want to kick the can on down the road, right? Man, we got to stop kicking the can on down the road, folks. We, we just don't have that much time left to do this. You know, I'm not a fear monger, and I'm not trying to get people in a panic. We just need to systematically, with forethought, in a calm, rational manner, get these pe people to understand that I'm talking about the ignorant masses. We're going to have to edge. You're going to have to, you know, you may have to do like the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not crazy about them. I'm not that crazy. But you have to. You have to give them credit. They pedal their bikes around and knock on your door. They really do. And you know what? I don't. I have yet to someone knock on my door and tell me about nuclear power, I, or chemtrails for that matter, or electromagnetic engineering for that matter, or the ongoing military uh, climate warming campaign the U.S. and Russia have been in with the chemtrails since the 70s. It's admitted. We have documents proving it all. It's not global warming. It's not climate change, right? All right. Okay, folks, you know, you can read the rest of this letter, and I implore you to. That is going to uh, be the end of the Plumegate section of this broadcast, and I hope you got some good information out of that. And if you want to brush up and learn even more, you can go to the Uncovering Plumegate blog, which is a WordPress blog, or you can visit my Hattrick Penry blog on WordPress. I've got a, a number of articles. I mean, since it's happened, I've produced oh, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 articles, at least that many videos, probably a lot more than that, and I've really been hammering it. And, and right now I want to make a point. Rather than me go about and try to tell people who a troll and who a shill is, and if you don't know what a troll and a shill is, let me explain in layman's terms. A troll or a shill or an apologist is someone who is usually paid by the, an establishment source or a corporate source or a government source or uh, the powers that be, the elite, the establishment, they have all the money. They print money as fast as they can. And they will hire these people to come online and, and in society and in common society to lie to you, out and out lie and deceive to you. They know the truth about nuclear power, but they are very well paid to convince you it's not so bad, to convince you the radiation never made it over here, to convince you you've nothing to worry about, and it is a perfect source of power for this uh, country and indeed this planet. Nothing could be more further from the truth. These people are the biggest sellouts we have ever seen. They're treasonous, make no mistake. And if Patrick Penry had total uh, control right now, I would be a benevolent dictator as best I could be. I know who I would hold accountable. The deceivers and the murderers, first of all. Okay, we're engaged in illegal wars. 
9-11. I don't argue space beams or box cutters. I look at you and I say, look, if you, myself, and two other people go to China, or Russia for that matter, hijack three or four of their planes and fly into their financial district, do you honestly really can look me in the eye and say, well, I guess Russia gets to occupy and invade America, and they'll be here shooting depleted uranium all over the place for a number of years? Do you honestly think China can occupy and invade us because some radicals from America flew planes in their buildings? No! This is ludicrous!